Freaking HOA Karen. I have the biggest Karen living in my neighborhood. So we bought our home three years ago. At the time of the purchase, we signed a set of bylaws for the subdivision that were laid out in the 60s when the neighborhood was being built. These rules included things like you couldn't have a separate building such as a shed, a pool house, carport, or garage. Now several, and I would even go as far to say the majority of homes, including mine and my grandparents who moved in in 77, have RV covers, we have carports, sheds or workshops, and the house across the street has a pool house. So needless to say, the original bylaws were never upheld. In October of 2018, we had our little girl at 26 weeks and spent the next four months in NICU. In December, on one of the rare occasions that I came home, a neighbor came by with some paperwork saying that there was a house renting on Verbo and it needed to be taken care of. I needed to sign this paper and get it back to her by 1231 so she could get it filed. I ignored the issue and I just don't care what someone else does with their property as long as it doesn't affect me, which this never did. The house was rarely rented out, and when it was, it was always a really quiet one. I never heard anything, never saw trash thrown about, and so on. Anyway, apparently she gathered enough signatures to amend the original bylaws to include a ban on renting Verbo. She then took the homeowner, who lived in a different state, by the way, to court, won, and had it put in the judgment that they had to sell their freaking house. So, at this same time, she came up with the idea of starting an HOA. That way, our neighborhood could stay safe and be able to take care of any problems that would arise. No elaboration there. October of 2019, she then began collecting signatures to add a new amendment to include forming an HOA. She and another lady in our neighborhood who was a notary collected and notarized signatures. Once she believed that she had her two-thirds vote that she thinks she needed, she filed the paperwork. She had been having neighborhood meetings, and I know of 19 of 47 homeowners who were never notified of meetings, until I found out about one and I posted about a sign at the end of the entrance and exit of the subdivision. Once we all showed up at this meeting, we were informed that the HOA had passed and we were all obligated to follow the rules and pay the dues that would be determined. I, along with the other 19 homeowners, made it very clear we were not part of any HOA and would not be participating or paying any dues. Shortly after this, I received an email saying that board members would be voted on via email and a $25 yearly due was due and I could make my check payable to her name. Other homeowners received an email saying that there was a one-time initiation fee of $115 bucks plus the $25 yearly due and thanking them for their contribution for legal fees for taking the Verbo house to court. Like, how much money has this lady got out of people? All this to say, I checked her math multiple ways. Votes per lot, votes per fraction of a lot, votes per number of owners, like every stupid way possible. The only way I can think that I didn't do it was by value of the home to value of the entire subdivision. Anyway, she never had over a 60% vote in favor of starting a POA or Property Owners Association HOA. I've caught her out on it and she refuses to acknowledge it. She is a real estate agent and there are a couple of houses in the neighborhood for sale. I looked at the listings and I noticed that one who signed for the HOA has association fees of $25. The other home, who did not sign for the HOA, does not have association fees listed. She's also now, well I'm sorry I don't know for sure who, someone has called the city on all of us heathens that won't sign the HOA. So the city has been writing warnings to almost everyone for something or another. Mine for a pile of brush left after cleaning out a flower bed and my grass for being over six inches. Neighbor for a stack of tile in her driveway and another for having a ladder and an inflatable boat on a dolly in their yard. Another for leaves in the ditch and so many other crazy offenses. Obviously, she's calling the city because she knows the HOA can't do anything. 
or at least she knows that we know she can't do anything. My concern is she's taking advantage of the elderly in the neighborhood that feel like the HOA is making them safe. She asked my elderly neighbor if she needed any groceries since she couldn't be getting out with all the COVID around. My neighbor said, no, she was fine. And then the lady turned around and said, oh, okay, well, do you have your $25 for dues? My neighbor's exact words were, I gave it to her. I'm afraid of what she would do to me if I didn't. Not that she thought she was being physically threatened, but she literally thinks she could lose her home over not paying these bullies. Is there anything I can try to give or say to these elderly to make them not feel threatened by her or the other board members? I think that someone that specializes in HOA law would love to have a word with Karen. I think she is just trying to push people that she feels like won't stand up for themselves and take advantage of them. And then when somebody does and actually gets onto her, they're going to take her down. What would you do? Lawyer up? How would you handle this one? It's called Mel Karen and Property Lines by Shortfinger Dizzy. I'm a senior construction superintendent in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. The project I'm currently on is a 13-acre site smack in the middle of an extremely effluent area to the north of Dallas. Three weeks ago, a city inspector that we'll call Joe came into the site office and said that they received a complaint about a sprinkler and soaker line being damaged during excavation for the fire lane. He, my landscaper, and myself went to investigate, discovered where a small fitting had blown out of the line. The landscaper repaired it. I went up to knock on the door to explain to them the issue and inform them of the repair. I got no answer at the door, so I left a card and a note asking them to call me, and they never did. A week later, Joe comes in and mentions that they've reached out again about the noise from the equipment, which is odd because anyone with heavy equipment is currently working on the other end of the property. I again went to speak with them, got no answer at the door, and I left a card again. Yesterday, in walks Joe to tell me that they're complaining about our construction fence, that it's on their property and killing their grass. The fence is 12 feet from their fence, and our specs call for it to be a minimum of 15 feet from the property line, so I pull up our CAD files on the survey plat so I can make sure that we have it placed exact and realize that their wood fence is 4 feet onto our property. Their house is about 14 inches onto our property too. So during all of this, I get an email from the city asking me to place the construction fence squarely on our property line. The email is sent to me, the apparent homeowner, Joe, and my project manager. I brought the surveyors back out yesterday to pinpoint our property corners and to give us some 10 feet offsets, reference points 10 feet east of the property line for line of sight to measure from. I knocked on the homeowner's door again, and I got no answer. Mind you, every time there were cars in the drive. Fast forward to this morning, my fence crew showed up and they began moving the fence onto the property line, which takes 31 inches, or 2 feet 7 inches, of their driveway, and 18 feet of the road where it ends at the property, it was previously a cul-de-sac. The client finally reached out, or more accurately, came to the site office in a huff. I explained the issue, I showed him the plat, and he left with some unkind words flowing from him like diesel exhaust on a steep incline. I put a pause on the fence relocation just to soothe the wound. My project manager called him, and I called the city right-of-way engineer and our client. We set up a meeting that just ended. He claimed that our plat was wrong. The engineer and everyone else disagreed. The back and forth went on long enough for the client, who is extremely laid back and a quiet gentleman, to finally speak up and basically say, hey, we're just going to go ahead and sell you the property that you've stolen at current market value plus 10%. In this area, that's not cheap. If that's not acceptable, we'll just have you move your fence, cut out your driveway, and use the east side of your home for advertisement. Or you can back off, let these guys work, and we'll give you lifetime use of the area that you currently occupy, so long as there's no more hassling of any kind. The guy asked me if we'd move the fence back out, and I told him no. I agreed to take it off his driveway, but the street and the green space belonged to us. We only did what he asked us to do. The engineer who asked me to move it agreed. Entitled Mom Trying to Own My Property, posted by Educational Aoli 944. This is a very complicated story, and I'm not sure if they are the entitled ones or me. 
My parents acquired several assets a long time ago. At some point, they were almost broken due to my mom's bad decisions. In order to protect the assets, the best option was to put everything on my name as I was the only minor at that time in the family. I was not even 10 and there is at least a 10 year gap with my sisters. But my mom, who never wanted me to have anything, decided that everything should be on my sibling's name. Moving time forward, when I was still underaged, my aunt by my dad's side decided to gift him a property, but because she didn't like my mom, the property ended up under my name. There's a couple of stories, not sure which one is true, regarding this property. So the first story they have is that my dad's dad bought the property and at some point he was short of cash so he asked my dad for money. He did give it to him even if he had several kids and was already married. My mom was not happy about it and my dad's dad could pay the mortgage. Nobody knows if my grandfather returned the money. Some people said that Aunt A took it with Uncle B, not married siblings. When my grandfather died, A inherited the property. There were conflicts with the will and later on she gave it to me. So the second story that they have lined up is that my dad bought it as a gift to my grandfather when he was still single and no kids. My dad paid the mortgage all his life even after he married my mom and had kids. The property was always on my grandfather's name and when he died A inherited it and later on she gave it to me. My parents have lived in the property several years. They no longer live there and they have put money onto that and they don't pay rent at all but they cover the maintenance cost. That was the verbal agreement that I had with them. Now, my sister bought a property in the same city. The property is nice, it's just in the same building with her in-laws, she's quite old and the banks won't give her a mortgage now, over 50. Having a property in that building has caused a lot of problems to my sister and she would like to have a different property so she's no longer close to her in-laws. On the other hand, my mom has always considered my property as her property and she wants to give a property in that city to my sister A but she can't do it because she doesn't have the money to buy another one and I won't put it on my sister's name. Another agreement is that we will keep whatever is on our name so I don't get anything but that property which actually comes from A, not my parents. And my dad also owns half of another property. My mom tried to buy the rest from B and put it under my sister's name but B put a very high price. I think he didn't want to sell it like that. So the question is, who's the entitled one here? Am I the entitled one because I don't want to give away the property? In other words, does it really belong to my parents? Or is my mom? Ooh, here's a really good piece of information. This will settle the story. It was given to you by your aunt, so you're the legal owner, not your mother. Comment says, and OP replies, Yes, legally the property is mine, but my mom considers it hers because my dad fully paid the mortgage, story two, when he was already with my mom. She has put a lot of money in renovations when living there, like a new bathroom, two bedrooms that were isolated, new windows, a new kitchen, and there's now GCH, on top of maintenance expenses that they, my dad and her, still pay. I should have mentioned that I have the property, but not the right to use it freely. It belongs to my dad. A wanted it like that, so my dad could use the property, but my mom wouldn't own it. My dad can't sell it. I mean, hey, if your name is on it legally, that is legally yours. What do you think? Karen tried to get a free hotel stay with a lawsuit posted by Little Motion and it has an update. Oh my gosh, here we go. For context, I'm a 22 year old woman, but I've been told that I look around 17. I work for a boutique hotel and resort as a front desk supervisor. Our resort is separated into three buildings, our hotel, our pools and spa, and our restaurant. I'm used to pretty high maintenance people for the most part. I've worked in customer service since leaving high school, so not a lot bothers me and I can usually diffuse stressful situations easily. Basically, I've seen my fair share of Karens. I'm not sure how it is at other hotels, but at my hotel, reservations that are made for the same day as check-in are treated with a bit more security since we've been scammed before. It's a security policy to make a copy of the driver's license at check-in in case the credit card turns out to be stolen. That way, we have a picture of the guest. Today, we had a same-day reservation come through a third party, something like Expedia or Priceline. No biggie. When the guest comes in, she seems nice enough. No typical Karen haircut or anything like that. I go through the motions, ask to see her ID and to get a credit card for incidentals. She hands them over and I set the ID on our scanner. What are you doing? She snaps. Hey, I'm just making a copy of your ID for the reservation. You can't do that. I thought, then I took the ID out to double check that it wasn't a military ID, which is illegal to copy in the US. It was a regular state driver's license. I'm sorry ma'am, it's a security policy. 
We do this with all of our same-day reservations. You think I'll scam you? You treat my people like this? My mother is disabled and you're making her wait in the car. To clarify, she was of Hispanic or Latina descent, one of the two. No ma'am, we do this every same day. She cuts me off. Get me your manager. I sigh and radio my manager to the front desk. Once she's there, Karen goes into this long rant about how we were stealing her personal information and how it was against the law to make copies of a person's ID. My manager looked at her and then at me. She's the woman on the ID. Just go ahead and check them in. I did as I was told and checked in the group of four into one of our handicap accessible rooms. These rooms were bigger with low profile beds and roll in showers for wheelchairs. Around an hour later, Karen called the desk asking for an extra blanket, asking me to turn up the thermostat for her because she couldn't figure it out, asking for extras of the free coffee in the room and whatever else that she could get for free. No biggie, that's what I'm here for. Now, here's where I nearly snapped. Later in the evening, she called me asking if we had a step stool for her mother to use to get into bed. Now, her mother was around my height, 5'7", and these beds were low profile already, but she was, for lack of better words, extremely overweight. So I believed it may be a bit more difficult for her to get from her motorized scooter onto the bed. I let them know that we didn't have a step stool in this building, but that I would be happy to call the spa and pool to see if they had one that we could use. The girl I spoke to at the desk told me that they had step stools in the locker rooms, but she didn't think that we could use them. She asked around and her manager said that they didn't have any extra stools. I called Karen. I'm sorry, but it doesn't look like that we have any stools on property for guest use in the rooms. For your inconvenience, I'd be happy to give you a meal voucher for dinner. She huffed. You have trash cans at your desk, right? Yes, ma'am, I have one trash can. That means you have others in the building that we can use. I paused, trying to figure out how that tied into our issue. I'm sorry, you do have two in your room, right? Well, yes, but they're small and not sturdy enough. If we double up, we can use that. Ma'am, you can't use our trash cans as step stools. Don't tell me what I can or can't do. You have two of those trash cans, don't ya? Not for that purpose, no. OP, you have empty rooms, don't ya? We do? Here's what you are going to do. You will go to these rooms and get me however many trash cans that I need. No, ma'am, I'm not going to do that. That made her mad. Excuse me? Those plastic trash cans are waste baskets for bathrooms. Even stacked up, they aren't made to hold the weight of an adult. That poses a risk for your mother, and if she fell off and got hurt, or if they broke and she cut her leg, that would make us liable. It's a major safety hazard. You know you're breaking the law by not making this room handicap accessible. The beds in those rooms are low profile and up to standard. She apparently didn't care and cut me off again, asking to be transferred to my manager. I let her know that I was acting manager since the woman she had spoken to at check-in had gone home for the night and wouldn't be in for two days. You can't be a supervisor or a manager, you're too young. Ma'am, I'm 22. No, you're not. Okay, I told her that I would be happy to help her come up with another solution. Call her at home. I'm sorry? You're going to call your manager at home, she demanded. I can try to reach her. No, you're going to reach her, and she hung up. No, I didn't get through to my manager. It was late into the night at that point. Of course I didn't. So I sent one of our maintenance men to the storage room, had him clean off one of his work stools, and had him take it to her. Was it clean enough? Of course not, but she took it. I'll sum the rest of tonight's drama since this post is long enough. Karen decided to ignore our non-smoking policy and smoked MJ inside the room, leading to complaints from other guests. When security confronted her, she told them that she would sue us for harassment because it was medical. We allowed her to smoke on her balcony, and she then threatened us for breaking a law because we didn't have a snack vending machine on our property. After many other complaints, she called me telling me to call my manager to comp her room for her trouble. I told her I wouldn't call her due to the time and that I was, again, active manager. But that, if she would like, I would be happy to put all of tonight's events into an email for her. We got an update, here's a conclusion. So this first part I got from my coworker that had taken over after I went home last night. According to him, aside from the noise complaints from the surrounding rooms, 
Karen decided her room service was not to her liking. So instead of calling the desk or setting the food in the hall for collection, she threw it against the wall, spraying ketchup all over our white walls and light brown carpet. In addition to this, her credit card had declined during night audit, meaning she was now staying there for free. A new credit card was put on file after I got in, followed by her saying that she wanted to split payment among the four adults staying in the room. Fine, can do. When the woman finally left, she stopped at the front desk to fight us on her rate and to put a third card on file. She had a double rate, signed for it and authorized it, but she demanded a free stay for her troubles. When we told her that she'd sign an agreement to pay for both nights, she threw a fit, saying, This is racist. With everything going on, you can't treat me like this. I am your customer. I will sue you for violating every law I've clocked during this stay. Ma'am, you've signed the contract. The contract? It's wrong. This place is horrible and I should have never stayed here. She then stormed out without giving us the credit card info. My manager called her, emailed her, and finally just charged the card that we had on file. I fully expect her to call me tonight to scream more, but at this point, I am so done. I'll be polite, but I'm not giving her any satisfaction. Imagine how different this story would have gone if OP did not stand up to Karen. She'd continue her Karen to raids just doing it because, well, people let her do it. What do you think? How would you handle this if you were OP? Entitled woman demands treatment for her husband for free by ND25607. This OP writes great stories. You're going to love it. Quick intro. I'm a 34 female nurse for a doctor's office and I also work overnights for an ER. I'm back again with another incident and no, not our lovely Kevin. One of my pet peeves is that people assume urgent care is an ER. People, please be smart and understand that they're not the same. It's an ordinary Wednesday with the usual patients coming in for treatment at the clinic when this couple comes into my clinic. My AA, administrative assistant, let's nickname her Nicole, greets them in and begins to register the patient after confirming that we do accept their insurance and will be able to treat them. He, let's call him Bob, he was really sweet, is wanting to be seen for a foot injury. We call him back to start getting his vitals, his blood pressure, temperature, height, and weight. Then, we send him back into the waiting room. After about five minutes, I begin to hear a commotion on the other side of the door into our waiting room. I take a brief pause with the patient and I go to see what all the chaos is. When I open the door, I see the patient's wife hurl a bottle of unknown substance at my poor administrative assistant. Here is what transpired. Karen says, what? Nicole says, I'm sorry, man, but we cannot. Our administrative assistant, Nicole, gets cut off. Bob says, I have VA insurance and Medicare. Is the VA primary? Yeah, the VA sent me here. No, your Medicare is primary, says to Bob. Shut up. No, his Medicare is primary, and turns and says it to our administrative assistant, Nicole. Uh, well, just give me a few minutes, Nicole replies. I will verify the insurance. If you wouldn't mind, could you fill out this additional paperwork? I approach Nicole, ask her what's going on. She tells me that they're here for a foot injury. They're angry that the VA wouldn't treat them and that she cannot get a straight answer out of them. So I go to the back real quick, grab something to photocopy, only to eavesdrop on the conversation. Ma'am, Nicole starts, I was able to confirm that the Medicare insurance is primary, so we will be able to run it under the Medicare policy. There's just a $40 copay due for today's visit. Excuse me? I'm sorry, but it looks like there's a $40 copay due for today's visit. How would you like to take care of it today? Very smugly, Karen replies, I don't get paid until Friday, so you will have to wait until Friday. I'm sorry, ma'am, but that is not how things work here. We cannot just treat you without being paid first. Oh, it's fine. You can treat him. We have nowhere else to go, and you can just bill us. I have VA coverage and Medicare. I shouldn't have to pay anything for today, Bob replies. That would be correct, sir. Only we are not in network with the VA or TRICARE, so we wouldn't be able to bill VA for your care or your copay. Therefore, we would have to collect the $40 copay in order for you to be seen. Look, can't you just treat my husband and bill us for today? No, ma'am. You will need to pay or I will have to ask you to leave. At this point, I emerge from behind the wall that had the photocopy machine. Hey, is everything okay? I say. Nicole tries to explain the situation, even though I've heard every single word, when the entitled Karen cuts off Nicole. This rude girl is refusing to have my husband seen. Isn't it your job to see anyone who is hurt or sick? Oh, I'm sorry, ma'am, that you've gotten confused. You see, we are an urgent care clinic. 
My provider and I will gladly see your husband as long as your insurance is within network. Our beautiful Karen replies, We are in network. Now treat my husband. Ma'am, I've been listening to your conversation with my administrative assistant, Nicole. Although you're in network, you're refusing to be treated in our clinic because you're refusing to pay for the treatment. Now, I don't care for your tone or how you've spoken to my administrative assistant. I think it's best you leave. You will need to take your husband to the nearest ER for treatment as they have measures set in place for individuals like yourself. How dare you speak to me like that? I demand to see the provider. Ma'am, as I am the head nurse here at this moment, I'm the only provider in the facility, and I refuse to see you. You cannot do that, she whimpers. It goes against your Hippocratic oath to take care of the sick and injured. Ma'am, I want to make it clear. I'm not refusing you. You are refusing me. Now, you're refusing to leave my clinic. Please leave, or I will have you escorted out of this building by the police. But, 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 but you, she stammers out while being dragged by her husband. This isn't the last you've heard from me. I will tell everyone I know how terrible this place is. I'm sorry, Bob says. Thank you for your time. I fully understand. He says sheepishly, as if he is embarrassed, turns to his wife. That's enough. Since this incident, Bob has returned for follow-up treatment on his injury. He is the sweetest man and refuses to bring his wife back to our clinic. I apologize profusely for the incident and how things transpired. While caring for him, I found out that he had a trailer hitch fall onto his foot. He suffered a minor sprain in his foot and Bob has been making a full recovery. Do you agree with this comment? 40 bucks for a medical treatment like that probably cost hundreds or thousands without insurance. How dare you? Darn Karen, how dare you pay for something that you're supposed to pay for? Today I screwed up accidentally catching a cheater during a test retake, posted by Thy Crow. So I've been pretty sick the past few days prior to the events and had to retake a test. How this goes, there are specific days during the week where you can retake a test after school hours. There's a couple people that watch over to make sure that people don't cheat. Anyway, I was minding my own business filling up a test. I finished well before the others because my test was just short. As I get up to hand in my test, I make eye contact with this girl in my gym class. She has her phone open in the book she's supposed to be using for her own test. It's clearly visible, at least when you stand up. So to warn her that she'll probably get caught, I gave her a uh, hide that crap motion with my hands to try and warn her. She just smiled and giggled a bit in her seat as though she was proud to be cheating or something. Anyway, as I hand in the paper, one of the teachers who's supposed to check on the students got distracted and started talking to me about some of my work. Well, I'm an artist and she commissioned me a couple of times. And I was also enthusiastic, so I tagged along the conversation, while whispering of course. We chatted for uh, maybe about a minute or two, and suddenly the teacher I'm with yelled, Hey you! And points to the girl that's cheating. I saw you! Give me your papers and leave right now! So I turn around because I'm curious of the situation. The girl that was caught was glaring at me so much. Holy crap. She then yells at me, you witch. And honestly, I was surprised and I kind of went like, huh? The girl gets annoyed at me and yells at me to leave. I didn't want to bother the other students in the class by letting her yell at me, so I left. Now, since I need to wait for a ride to get back home, I waited in the cafeteria. It didn't take long for her to come see me. She started yelling at me, all angry, calling me a witch, telling me to shut up whenever I tried to explain the situation. Well, I thought it was ridiculous, so I started smiling and laughing, which really didn't help my case. I got home and did my homework as usual. The next day, though, I wanted to try and settle things correctly before she starts spreading rumors. She's one of those gossip girls. So I found her in my gym class and tried to talk things through because I expected her to have calmed down by now. <laughs> nope. She went all out on me, cussed me out again, didn't let me explain. She got so heated that she ended up punching me in my mouth. I really didn't expect her to become physically agitated, nor have I ever had a punch thrown at me, so I wasn't able to dodge it. Split my lip open. I didn't want to start a fight, so I continued to talk calmly. This time though, I was pretty agitated myself, so I responded in a passive aggressive way, mainly to tell her how ridiculous it is to have gotten mad at me for getting caught cheating, and even more for that punch. I mean, she's 17 for freaking sake. I left the class to get my face cleaned up. Fast forward to today, three days later. There's been rumors going on around the school for my snitching. A reminder, I didn't. And I've been getting called names since. 
a broken lip, and the reputation of a teacher's pet, all because of a misunderstanding. I just hope it dies down a bit because I really, and I mean I really, don't want to leave things at that. There is no reason for both of us to hate each other. Oh, school drama. Yeah, it's all about misunderstandings and not knowing the full extent of the situation and the ramifications of it. OP, you're fine. The other person is a sore loser because they got caught. But what do you think? Today I screwed up by quitting my dream job that I worked three years to get, posted by the Tardit. I just quit the police academy a few days ago and I had worked so hard to get there. I quit because I think I was having serious anxiety issues and doubts about my happiness in the job. I was fine until a few weeks ago when I started having very negative thoughts about the job and then I learned we were going to be CS gassed. Part of the training was slightly hazing in the first few weeks. We were pre-exhausted before being smothered, yes, smothered, not blood choked, unconscious. It took minutes and it was the most horrific experience of my life. It took me into a primal place into my brain where I felt like an animal and I was not myself anymore. I screamed and clawed and bit one of the instructors. I think this made me very worried about being gassed because it made me terrified of not being able to breathe. I'm 26 and recently married with no children. My wife has been amazing and supported me through whatever I've decided to do. I think that my stress and worry is rubbing off on and affecting her though. I'm stressed because I have really have no backup plan. I mean, I have enough emergency money to pay rent and food for a few months, and, and I know that I can get a job, and I'm actively searching right now. I, I'm mainly stressed because I have no idea what the frick I want to do with my life now. I, I spent the last three years working security and going through the process of becoming a police officer. <laughs> and right now, I just want to get a good career going that pays decent, like 60,000 plus preferred, to live comfortably. I have an associate's of general arts degree, and I was thinking about going into accounting or like some other business major and working my way through school in a normal job. I feel I've let my family and my friends down for giving up on what I thought was my dream. Thank you guys for letting me get this off my chest. I don't want to tell my wife or family my feelings about things now because it'll make me look flaky and weak. I feel ashamed and like a failure. Well, I think OP is not a failure because you want to do something and then you try it out and you realize, you know, hey, maybe this isn't for me. I thought it was, but now that I've actually done it, it's not. It's deeper, it's more nuanced and in depth than the surface level. What do you think? Neighbor had my brother's car towed on our property, and this guy is a deployed Marine by Sunday Shadow Rain. My little brother is a Marine and is currently deployed in Hawaii, and his car has been on our property for a while now because, well, he can't come and drive it since he's in Hawaii. This apparently gives Karen the idea to call a tow truck because it hasn't been moved since he left it. It's not even a terrible looking car either, but I guess it ticked her off that it was sitting there due to being a car that she didn't know. My grandmother's now dead truck has been there longer, but the entitled old Karen knows whose it is because she's seen her drive it. This happened between the time that my grandmother and I left for Costco and the time we got home. The old Karen called the towing company to tow my brother's car because, in her batty old boomer logic, after my grandmother went over to her house to confront her, it's been there for over two weeks and it's just sitting there, on our property, not hurting anything. Her husband, a nice neighbor, as crotchety as he can be, was unaware that his wife did this because he likely wasn't home, so he said that he wasn't sure when he had talked to us. So now my grandmother has to call the police and the towing company to get the car back and she is rightfully furious, as am I, about this because it means another towing fee that was completely unnecessary. She can't even get it until tomorrow because nothing is even open. She was met with voicemails of the towing not even being open either, which is bizarre before 7 p.m., but whatever, I don't know the towing hours since we haven't had to deal with that before. I absolutely hate the old Karen with a seething and unholy passion because this isn't the first time that she's attempted this garbage either. She's done this on other neighbors because she thinks she can police the neighborhood because of her corner house logic. I do not care how rude this makes me, but I will not be paying that towing fee and I will not be letting my grandmother pay it. The old Karen will be paying that because it was none of her business to be nosing her old face into things. 
I don't care if you're old. You do not stick your nose in someone else's business and life, especially if the thing in question is on someone else's property. I will take this woman to court if she refuses to pay for this because she had no right to do this. I mean, what was my brother supposed to do? Be all like, oh hey guys, it's been two weeks. Let me go back to my grandmother's and drive my car around the block. I'll be back on Monday with all the flights. Yeah, as if his CO would allow for that just because of Karen. An update. My cranky and tired butt marched over to her house. She was awakened outside and ripped her a new one about keeping her nose in her own crap and to pay for the towing or I was going to take it higher up and nail her for illegally having it towed. She's paying for the tow truck reluctantly. I haven't slept. Thanks Insomnia, you're a pal. So I have no craps to give about being cordial or polite with this bull crap. Entitled people need to mind their own dang business and leave people alone. This commenter points out that the towing trouble could have gotten in legal trouble too. Do you agree? If the towing company gives you trouble, remind them that they removed the car from private property without permission of the property owner. So they actually stole the car and you will be calling the police on them if it's not returned immediately. Just because someone calls them to remove a car, they need proof that it should be moved first. 100% true. Also, a tow off from private property requires a signature, at which point she was impersonating the homeowner felony charges there, maybe a little fear will stick her nose back into her face for a day or two. No hope for a permanent solution, I'm sure she truly thinks she is helping. Would have you pressed charges on the Karen if she didn't pay? Let me know. Give me your property, you don't need it right now, and the unexpected MVPs, posted by Blue Bindweed. I thought stores would be closed off or working much shorter hours during the holidays. Once I got to the store, I saw that it was, sadly for most people working there, mostly wrong. But that meant I would not need to buy much as I initially thought. I brought with me three reusable shopping bags but ended up needing just one. While I can't say that I have an emotional attachment to these bags, I do like them very much. I bought them because I loved the design, the color and the print on them, and gave a bit more money than one would buying reusable shopping bags in the grocery store. They're nice, practical, and I like them. I finished loading my stuff onto the conveyor belt at the cash register and I put the separator so that the person behind me doesn't waste time but start uploading their haul. Last, I put my three bags on top of my stuff because I had them in the shopping cart while I was picking stuff up. While I am fishing out my wallet for my purse, I catch a flash of collar in my periphery. I look up and see the woman behind me reached over and take two of my bags. Confused, I stutter. Excuse me, those are not store bags. Those are my own property. Please give them back to me. Entitled woman Karen says, I know these are not the store ones. I'm not an idiot. This store has red bags with their logo on them. Okay, then why are you taking my property? You don't need all of them. Your groceries will fit nicely into just that one. I need these. Mind your own business and stop making a scene. Now I'm confused and getting irritated. I'm making a scene for confronting her politely about taking my stuff? But before I can even react, the older gentleman, who was a customer before me in the line, he had just finished paying for his bill, as well as the cashier, round up on this woman. The cashier says, you will give her back her property or I will have the security escort you out. The customer before me said, how dare you behave as you are the one being inconvenienced. You take this girl's property and tell her that she does not need it and should not resist you. If you need reusable bags, just buy them for yourself. Karen starts huffing and puffing. Now wait just a minute, why are you all making such a scene? The cashier all but yells, now I'm not negotiating or listening to you. Taking the property of others is stealing, no matter how you try to reason it. The cashier then picks up her mic and calls security to the register and looks at Karen sternly. What'll it be? Karen gives me back my bags while mumbling something about, it's just a few worthless bags. I thank the cashier and the old man and go on my merry way. I did not do much, but stand my ground, but the cashier and the old man were the MVPs. It did warm my heart that people saw something nasty and immediately jumped in to correct the foul behavior. Jiffy Lube didn't put oil in my car. What are my legal options? Posted by Wizzleman. 
Yesterday, I took my car to Jiffy Loop for a routine oil change. After leaving their shop, I drove 20 to 30 minutes and my car seized up in a busy intersection. I was able to start it up again and get to a parking lot about 100 yards away. Upon checking, I found out that they didn't put oil back in my car. I have evidence in the form of photos showing the lack of oil and any warning lights that appeared on my dashboard. I immediately stopped driving and contacted the store. I was put on hold and then the manager said that they would check the footage and get back to me. He then calls me on his cell phone and says it looks like that they put oil in, but they aren't sure they put enough and he's going to drive out to me immediately to come put oil in. When he gets there, he says after watching the footage, his tech didn't put a drop of oil in the car and he was extremely sorry and they're going to tow it and make everything right. Today, he called me and said, great news, the car is up and running and his district manager is coming down to sign off on it and we'll be back on the road. I was giving pushback because I do not feel comfortable driving the car now because there's no way it doesn't have damage. His response is that he only deals in black and white and what's real and I can't trust what Google has to say and he's got the car right in front of him and it's looking good. On this call, he casually mentioned that the car wouldn't start in the morning and he had to do a bunch of work to get it up and running. He also stated that when he changed the oil again this morning, he found metal shavings. He also mentioned on our 22 minute call that there is still a check engine light on for what he believes is a misfire and the engine is making a noise. Yet, he feels he should be able to correct all these problems and it will be good enough for me to drive by tomorrow. Keep in mind, I've been recording our call since the start so I have proof of him admitting all of this. I'm hoping to get advice on. What should my next step be if they refuse to replace the engine and pay for a new car? Am I owed anything due to the negligence of emptying my car of oil, failing to fill it up, having me pay and letting me drive off? Plus the risk of having my car seize up on the highway or a more dangerous situation, not to mention the sentimental value of the car being my first car. Is there anything specific I should document or do to ensure that I have a strong case if this escalates? Has anyone here ever had a similar experience and how'd you handle it? Commenter says and OP replies, You need to have a good mechanic assess whether there is lasting damage, then you'll have a baseline to work from for any lawsuit and or insurance claim. As for the risk of whether this or that happened, not worth mentioning, same for the sentimental value. OP replies, He said if there's a second opinion, they get to choose the mechanic and I can't take it to the dealership or it'll absolve them of any responsibility. I'm not a lawyer, but they're not mechanics and you do not take advice from the people you're probably going to have to sue. What do you think? HOA Dissolution I'm the president for our local HOA and I'm gathering information to possibly put forth a motion to dissolve our HOA. The HOA has never truly functioned, never collected funds for maintenance or taxes, and generally hasn't essentially existed in any form except on paper. It's in a newish section of an existing neighborhood with about 20 plus properties involved. A fellow board member is really pushing to get it going and I can't get past the question of why, if it's been going on for this long without doing anything. We have no real common areas like a pool or a clubhouse or a playground and the city will take over the maintenance of sidewalks and the streets of our little three cul-de-sac HOA. My only stumbling block is the detention pond that runs along six to seven properties and a joint driveway that connects two to three properties that runs alongside the detention pond for those six to seven properties. My thought would be to quick claim the pond to those adjoining properties for a buck and they can split the pond along property lines and take over maintenance. Maintenance that hasn't been done by the HOA. I'm thinking to include in the dissolution a one-time maintenance request to clear the area of any growth, just a quick bush hogging to clear the brush, and then transfer ownership of consenting parties if they agree. My last thought, if they don't want to take ownership, is to quit claim to myself and I'll take over the maintenance and the taxes, which is $60 a year in taxes and probably once a month mowing after the initial clearing and whatever the insurance cost, assuming two-thirds are in favor of dissolution. We get a question in reply asking if they've consulted a lawyer and that two-thirds seems low. And OP replies, good point, dissolution is a two-thirds majority vote. In terms of the city, in talks with the public works, they have no issue with the street and sidewalk reverting back to them. It's three small cul-de-sacs, so it isn't much to take. 
quick claiming would only be in the event of an adjoining property's not taking ownership but still wanting dissolution of the HOA. I would first see if the adjoining six or so properties would agree to take ownership and if not, possibly going from there on, taking ownership of the detention pond myself, depending on insurance cost. I just don't know who would be willing to buy a detention pond with no other property at auction. Doesn't seem like an attractive buy. But yeah, I agree about busybody proofing. Our next meeting will be to clarify some rules and my plan is to just gut everything, but maintenance and insurance if I can. I wasn't a fan of HOAs and most of us weren't forewarned before buying. I tried to be clear to folks coming in after us when I got elected president and have been slow walking ever since. Most of the neighborhood isn't too thrilled with it and it's only one property that's pushing, which is our resident busybody. Would you take apart this HOA or leave it intact? Just go ahead and take it down. Why not tear it apart? No, Karen, I won't wash your car. Posted by Potential Drive 8623. This happened three days ago and I still don't know what Karen was thinking, but working in retail for close to 20 years, I'm not shocked. So we have me as the OP, we have Karen, the neighbor guy, and then the guy who owns the lodge. Okay, so the setting. It's a hot and sunny Thursday afternoon, and I wrapped up work since I work very early mornings on Thursdays, and I get the afternoon off. I decided to wash my car since it got covered in dust from gravel roads and being surrounded by lakes, the front gets covered in bugs. Gross, I know. So I break out my equipment power washer, foam blaster, buckets, new car soap, speaker to listen to music, and a little cooler with refreshments. I just finished spraying my car to spray soap on to clean when my neighbor, who was also washing his Escalade, waved me over. Neighbor says, hey OP, can I ask you for some help? I say, yeah sure, what's up? Hey, can you blast that dirt off of the bottom for me? The missus took the car out and somehow this happened. I took a quick look. It's got some mud, pretty good caked on, but not impossible to get off. Yeah sure, I say, this will just take uh, just a couple minutes or so. So I brought my pressure washer over, turned it on, and started spraying the dirt off while rocking out the nickel back. Only took about three, maybe four minutes, and I got it off. Neighbor says, hey, those things work great cleaning. I need to invest in one. Thanks, OP. I say, sure thing, neighbor. Happy to help. So I wrapped up and resumed my car washing while enjoying Nickelback's album Dark Horse when a dirty Lincoln stops behind my car and the lady is waving me over. Now I should explain that I live at the end of the road and we don't have anything people would drive to unless you're visiting someone and the main road is close to eight blocks away. So yeah, not many cars drive by my house. Anyway, I walk up to the lady's car to see what she wants. Maybe she's lost or she can't find someone's house. Nope, I was wrong. Here's the conversation. I say, yes, can I help you ma'am? And she says, Yes, since you just finished, can you wash my car? Also, I like the seats and carpets cleaned as well. I'm confused for a minute and I reply, Uh, wait, what? Uh, didn't you hear what I said? I'd like my car cleaned. I just got this and it's already got dirt and bugs on it. Sorry, but no, I'm not going to. But there is a couple of car washes down the main street and I think the shops offer it too. Karen, who clearly never was told no, looks at me and goes, why would I do that? You have everything to do it here. Just do it. You wash that guy's car. Now do the same for me and make sure to use wax as well. I reply, no, 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 no. I didn't wash his car. I just quickly helped him to get the dirt off. I'm only washing my car. What did you say? Fine. How much for a wash? She replies, uh, what? What? Can't you hear? I said, how much? Lady, I don't know who you are, and frankly, I don't care. I'm only washing my car. If you need your car washed, go downtown. What now? Honestly, what is wrong with you kids today? You don't want to work and get money. This is ridiculous. She did go into a little tirade that I won't go into, but then she gassed it down towards Main Street. I look at my neighbor. We both shook our heads and resumed what we were doing. About three hours later, I was busy playing Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 when someone rang my doorbell. I stopped playing and I went to go see who it was, and I opened the door and I see a guy standing there. He says, Hi, I'm the guy who owns the lodge. Did a lady ask you if you can wash her car? I reply, Yeah, some lady did, and she acted kind of like a toddler when I told her no. Why? He says, 
That lady was complaining that the guy over there was rude and didn't want to help her. If you see her, just ignore her. I'm not going to let them stay here anymore. The husband is nice, but she's a piece of work. So I reply, okay, sure, sure, but just out of curiosity, there's a lodge over there? The other guy laughs and says, yeah, we only do it over the summer and about three weeks during the winter. So in one day, I learned that Karens can come at you anywhere and anytime, and I live about two blocks away from a lodge. A very interesting day. So funny update here, a commenter says, you had a chance to go, how much? 10, $10? No, $10,000. No refunds or reclamations payable in advance. And OP says, I should have, but after working 10 hours, I wasn't thinking, but if it happens again, I will. Entitled person runs through construction site, complains about the construction, posted by Nice Rock, bro. Context. A couple of years back, I got a job installing artworks at a large outdoor art exhibition. Basically, a bunch of cool sculptures would be placed along a popular walkway and in surrounding parks so that the public could freely walk and interact with them for a few weeks before they were sold to private collectors. It's super popular here and, please note, happens every year. Because the installations aren't permanent, we have to bury large slabs of concrete in the ground to act as bases or ship in huge weights to hold them down so people don't steal them or push them over, which did actually happen that year, $50,000 off a cliff, but whatever. I should also note that this takes place in a super wealthy area of town, like one of the most expensive places to live in the country, if not the world. So we get a lot of really out of touch rich people coming through and most of my stories are about them. Story. So the main walkway is big enough for pedestrians only, which means we have to lower the weights in by crane. To do this, we stationed people, me, on the path just before the installation point, and once signaled, we would rope off the path so the crane could lower these insanely heavy slabs down to us. Because the walkway is popular, and I cannot stress this enough, the path would only be closed for about two minutes tops each time, and reopened in between deliveries so people could pass through. Enter me, getting the signal that one of the slabs is about to cross over the path. I rope off the area, stand there in my high visibility uniform, and explain to the people waiting that there is construction work ahead and to wait two minutes. Most are chill, there's a crowd, whatever. Enter entitled person. Runner type, fancy Fitbit, totally in the zone. He runs up to the rope, no sign of stopping, and glares at me. I put up my hand and start to say my, sorry sir, we're just moving a sculpture ahead. It'll be a minute tops and then you can go, spiel, but the guy has already lifted and ducked under the tape. I start fumbling for my walkie talkie, uh, hey boss, you, you know that comically large concrete slab that you're currently moving, there's a guy under it probably. But it turns out, I don't need to, because I can already hear shouting from around the bend. What the heck, that could have hit me mate. Jeez, is all I hear before my boss pops his head up from the crane and looks at me. I do an, I don't know man, hands, and point to the rope. He does a comical face palm and heads back. I heard from my coworker who was guiding the block down that apparently after yelling his piece, he kept on running again, still through the active sight. He was out of the way of further danger by then, but gotta get that cardio, I guess. My daughter invited her eight-year-old friend to swim in our new pool, and the friend brings her toddler sister along with the swimsuit on. I told the friend's sister she could swim too if the mom comes to watch her and sends her home with that message. Entitled mom sends both back again, repeatedly. This is by Nick Knox. So let me tell y'all about how this entitled mom tried to have me be her free babysitter and lifeguard. We just got one of those above ground pools that you set up yourself that's 4 feet deep and 14 feet round. We spent the majority of two days prepping and filling it and letting it warm. Finally yesterday, it was ready. And my daughter asked if she could invite a little girl that she's semi-friendly with from down the street to come swim with her. Since they're eight, they're tall enough to stand with their heads above water, and I said, okay. Well, her little friend brought her toddler sister, who is probably on the younger side of two. Definitely too small to stand with the head above water. Well, I tell her friend that the little sister can't get in the water unless her mom is here to watch her, and then I send her home with that message. They both come back, and she says, 
mom says she's fine in her float and I can watch her. And I said, no, it's not fine. I don't think an eight-year-old is responsible enough to watch a toddler in a pool and I'm not going to be the one watching her either. You need to tell your mom either she comes to watch your little sister or she is not getting in the pool. They both go home and then both come back. At this point, I am livid and walk back to their house with them and pound on the door. No answer. I keep knocking and then the garage door starts to open with this woman backing her car out. I quickly went and stood at the end of the driveway with all the kids in tow, both of hers and both of mine. She gets out of her car all PO'd and asks me what my problem is. I tell her my problem is that I'm not her babysitter and that I am definitely not going to be responsible for keeping her baby from drowning in my swimming pool on my property. She then proceeds to start baby talking her own kids saying, I'm sorry, sorry babies, the mean lady isn't going to let you swim. I'm so sorry princesses. And on and on. Of course the toddler bursts into tears and then the entitled mom screams at me. Look what you've done! You've made her cry and ruined her day! I hope you're proud of yourself! She then snatches up the little sister who's screaming and tosses her in the car and screams at her friend to get in too. Friend is red in the face and you can tell she is so embarrassed and just mumbles sorry while climbing in the car. Entitled mom then proceeds to peel out of her driveway and then we walk back home. Jerk! Since it seems to be assumed, I was not leaving the kids unattended. I was right beside the pool during yard work and planned on continuing once all the kids were in the pool. I did not want to watch a small toddler in the pool as she would require extreme supervision, like sitting and staring directly at her kind of supervision. Also, on top of that, my rule was refused when I asked politely the first time and demanded a second time and then this woman tried to leave. After knowing, I said no. For anyone who's saying, well, you could have just watched her. No, I couldn't. I didn't want to, and I don't need a reason not to be a free babysitter for a tiny toddler that I have literally never met. Okay, so as a dad, your kid's life and the babysitting is very important. You need to have all of your ducks in a row, so to speak, everything laid out, where you're going, when you're going to be back, all of that contact information, knowing what's going on, everything, and give them a little bit of freedom, but not like this. This lady needed to confirm what was going on and not just drop her kid off at the pool pun kind of intended there with this lady entitled parent yells at me for getting her kid wet at the pool posted by desert storm 1157 so i live in texas and in texas it gets unbearably hot in the summer i have had swimming lessons since i was five and have been on a swim team since i was nine this happened a year ago but i still remember it being one of the most crazy experiences i have ever had Anyway, so our coach was making us a 100 meter IM. IM stands for individual medley, and we had four sets in the IM, butterfly, backstroke, breaststroke, and freestyle. Enter NK, nice kid. So I was about halfway through my set and did a type of turn called a flip turn. It's when you flip around at the wall to turn. I did my flip and splashed some water out of the pool. Mind you, it was a small amount. And as luck would have it, at this moment, nice kid was walking to his lane in the pool. He wasn't wet yet because his set was the one after mine, and I didn't see what happened then because I was still swimming, but I guess the water must have hit his foot and ankle. What I didn't realize was that the entitled mom was watching her kid walk to his lane. Understandable, as many parents at my swim meets like to cheer on their kids. So I finished my set and climbed out of the pool. As soon as I set foot on land, the entitled mom comes barreling through the crowd like a freight train. I have my back turned so I don't see that it's me she's coming for. The entitled mom grabs my shoulder and spins me around. Mind you, I'm still soaking wet. She then starts yelling, apologize. For what? For attacking my kid, you like freak. What? Ma'am, I think you have the wrong. She cuts me off as entitled mothers do. Shut up and say sorry to my baby. Meanwhile, the nice kid is just standing there looking quite embarrassed. What do you mean? I saw you intentionally splashed water on my son, which could have hurt him. Yeah, lady, like water being splashed is going to cause a deadly injury. Ma'am, I had no control over the water hitting your son. It was an accident. Why do they even let fat people like you swim? This set me off. I'm a big person and I'm extremely self-conscious about my chest and stomach area. Hey, why don't you pack up your kid and get the heck out of here? No, apologize, you little she then starts shoving me towards her kid and I shove back. Eventually, nice kid pulls his mother off me. Mom, leave him alone. He didn't do anything wrong. Just let's just go. But mom, we're leaving now. Fine, sweetie, let's go. 
the nice kid mouths sorry as they walk out and I wave at him. As the entitled mom looks at me one last time, I flip her off and walk to my parents to dry off. I told them the whole encounter and they asked me if I wanted to find her and call the police. I said no, because if she gets arrested later on, it's basically Darwinism. Am I the a-hole for leaving little children in the pool? Posted by Chicken Nougat. I, 24, female, went to my niece's, 9, female, birthday party last weekend. Due to the world turning upside down, it's been a while since I've seen my nieces and nephews, so I was pretty pumped to finally see them. It was a pool party, so after being begged by my niece, I borrowed a swimsuit from my cousin and jumped in with the kids. This is where it gets weird. I was playing with my niece when two little girls, who I assume are my niece's friends, started clinging on to me. Yes, my niece was doing the same, but this is my niece. I changed her diapers and watched her since she was a baby. These girls, though, I had no idea who they were. My niece was still visibly upset and annoyed by her friends, but she included them in our game still. After a while, I just wanted to get out because one of the little girls started going underwater, grabbing my legs and trying to wiggle it. Not sure what her aim was. She was very touchy. It made me feel very weird. I've tried asking them to stop, but nothing. So I told my niece to go with her brother, he's 16, while I go dry up, and so I was fed up with these random kids. We were in the very shallow end, I think like it was two feet. I just left them there and opened a bottle of cold one with my cousins. Later on, some lady approaches me and tells me it wasn't very nice of me to leave her kids out like that. I ask her what she meant. I've never met this woman in my life. She berated me that it was my duty as one of the adults in the pool to ensure the children were safe and not left alone. I laugh and explain to her that I'm not a babysitter. I'm actually a guest just like her. My cousin told her to knock it off, but the other moms kind of just glared at me. Am I the a-hole here? So to summaries, I went swimming with my niece and her friends start to crawl all over me and touch me and I get out of the pool and I get confronted by their mom for leaving them. So they wasn't the only adult in the pool or by the pool, it looks like. This was a party, so there were lots of other adults there. So, hmm, if this was your kid, then yes, you absolutely would be. If not, I would at least just check with somebody, but say, hey, you got this kid, but it's ultimately not your responsibility. I think this person should have been watching their own kids because, hey, that's what you're supposed to do as a parent, right? Am I the a for not sharing my car with my stepbrother? Posted by Star City Blues 45. My parents are divorced but cordial. My mother married my stepdad when I was 11. I have a stepbrother who is my age and a half-brother who is four. My dad recently brought me a new car for my birthday. My brother also had bought a car, which he bought with his money. It was secondhand but in good condition. Just a few days after I got my car, he had a crash in which his car was severely damaged. This was not the first time he was reckless with a car, and earlier he'd almost crashed his father's car as well, with me in the back seat and his father in the front. It's one of those reasons my stepdad refused to buy him a car. A few days back when I returned from my friend's house who lived nearby, I saw my car gone from the driveway. I immediately ran into the house and started looking and asking my mom and stepdad about it. My stepdad looked bewildered, but my mom calmly got up from her seat and told me she'd given in my car to my stepbrother to go visit his friends, who lived quite some distance away. I started to panic and asked her why she would do that. She simply said it's what siblings do, and then from then on me and my stepbrother could use the car on alternate days. By this point, my stepdad had come over to us and told her she shouldn't have done it without my permission. He told her that if anything happened to the car, then she would have to pay. She agreed. Well, something did happen. Stepbrother crashed the car, hood and headlights and airbags needed to be replaced. I informed my father about this and after assessing the damage, he's learning what led to this, he immediately said, either the stepbrother or the mother has to pay for the part of the repair cost which the insurance doesn't cover. My mother tried to negotiate but he wouldn't budge. She asked stepdad and he wouldn't help either, so she had to give the money from her savings. Yesterday, after the car had come back from the mechanic, she came to me and asked for my car keys. I asked what was up and she reminded me of the alternative day policy. I told her that she was out of her mind to even think that I would share the car with my stepbrother after all this, but she just said she had promised the stepbrother his share of days and that's also the reason she had the car repaired so that both of us could use it. I took the car keys and locked the door of my room. She then called me ungrateful. My stepbrother said I was depriving him of meeting his friends and he was suffering. My stepdad later came and put stop to it. The only reason I think I might be the a-hole is because I know my stepbrother wasn't lying about his mental health issues. He's had to see a therapist because of it. His friends have been really helpful in his struggle with his mental health and my mother did say that she would pay for the damages. So I don't know, should I just give my stepbrother another chance? Am I the a-hole? Also I did offer to drive my brother to his friends but he straight up refused saying it would embarrass him. Well, no, 0 out of 10, you are absolutely not. He has shown himself to be irresponsible with this car, and he should not be the one that is 
you know, taking your car like this. You shouldn't be on the hook. He should be liable. There are other ways. There are Ubers. There are other things you offered. No, you were completely fine. I would agree with you that you're doing the right thing. The HOA finds me, but I'm not even in the HOA. Click the video on your screen so you don't miss the fallout of this one, and I'll see you there.